So we are almost to an end of Math 52 Intermediate Algebra and we're getting ready for our last exam. And so we're going to just kind of review today of what you will be seeing or um, need to know for the test. And so the first topic for this exam that we looked at was solving um, nonlinear inequalities. So maybe so topics. Nonlinear inequalities. Okay, so these were, we solved these a little differently. We solved these where we had to get everything to one side of the inequality and set it um, less than, greater than, equal to zero, could have the equal to part to that inequality, and then find our critical numbers. If it was a linear inequality, we solved it just like it was you isolated your variable and got everything else to the other side. So we have to remember there's that it's a different way to solve these if it's nonlinear. Um, so if, let's look at an example. Let's say we had x squared minus 8x plus 12 is less than zero. And so it asks you to solve this. Graph the solution. On the number line. And write your solution in interval notation. Okay, so everything is already on one side of our inequality. And so we're okay there. And so this is where we had to find our critical numbers. And critical numbers were the numbers that set this equal to zero. And so once we found our critical numbers, we put this on the number line. I shouldn't have done the number line yet. So let's look at when is x squared minus 8x plus 12, when is this equal to zero? So looking at this, it's a quadratic equation. I would first try to solve this by factoring if possible. And it is factorable because there's two numbers that multiply to positive 12 and add to negative eight. And so this is the same thing as x minus six times x minus two. And so setting those equal to zero, we can see that x equals six x minus 6 equals 0 when x is 6, x minus 2 equals 0 when x is equal to 2. That's where we put these on the number line. And we had to test intervals. We had to see if it was true or false. And so we chose something to the left of 2. So if zero falls in that interval and is not a critical number, then you can choose it, and that's the easiest one. So if we plug this back in for x into our inequality, is zero squared minus eight times zero plus 12, is this less than zero? And that's false, 12 is not less than zero. So I know that from negative infinity to two could not be part of my solution because it doesn't um, come out as a true statement. So choose a number between two and six. So how about x equals three? If we plug it in for wherever we see an x in the inequality, we have three squared minus eight times three plus 12. Is this less than zero? So three squared is nine. Negative eight times three is negative 24, plus 12, less than zero. 
So 9 plus 12, I'm just adding the positive numbers first, is 21, and 21 minus 24. So this is going to give me negative 3, which is less than 0. So that tells me any number between 2 and 6 is part of my solution. Maybe we can just shade it in now, at least up to the, the um, critical numbers. And now choose a number that is bigger than 6. So if we substitute 7, wherever we see an x, we get 7 squared minus 8 times 7 plus 12. Is this less than zero? So 49 minus 56 plus 12. Okay, well 49 plus 12, adding my positive numbers, that is 61 and 61 minus 56, that is five. And five is not smaller than zero, so that's false. Okay, so we found that our solution is between two and six. And so this is where you had to decide, did you include the endpoints or not those critical numbers for your inequality as part of your solution? And that had to do deal with what type of inequality was it? If it was strictly less than or strictly greater than, you never include those um, critical numbers. If it had the equal sign to, well, those are the values which made it equal to zero, and so you would include them. Only time you would not include a critical number is if that was the value which set a denominator equal zero, but we don't have any variables in our denominator, so we don't have to worry about that. So we're not including two, and so we're gonna put a, a parenthesis there. Same thing, we're not including six, but we're including everything in between. So our solution is two to six in interval notation which is the same thing in inequality notation as two is less than x, which has to be less than six. But because I asked for interval notation in the directions, this is the one you wanted. Okay, so I kind of want to go back to that problem. Um, and I want to now let us look at this in terms of graphing, because we did look at graphing quadratic equations. So that's going to kind of review of graphing a quadratic. So same, maybe we can just keep with that same equation. So, so a review, you should be able to graph quadratic equations. With that, you should be able to find the vertex. Um, be able to tell if it's a max or a min. and why. So if we were looking at any applications that are asking you to maximize or minimize something, it's going to be a quadratic equation in this class. And so basically you're going to have to find your vertex. If you're asked what um, is the maximum value or the minimum value, that is always the y value. And the x value is where it occurs. Um, but so you should be able to find the vertex. Um, you should be able to find x and y intercepts. So x intercepts, y is always zero, so set um, y equal to zero, solve for x. y intercepts, that's when x is always zero, plug in zero for x and solve for y. 
and then you should be able to find axis of symmetry. This was that vertical line where you could fold your paper and that parabola would be lying on top of each other. There was a mirror image across that line. Well, that was the X value of the vertex. That was the vertical line. So it's gonna be X equals H, where H equals the X value of the vertex. You should be able to tell me um, the domain and range. The domain, well, there's no trouble spots, so that's everything. It's the range, though. Well, it depends on where your vertex is. So are your y values going to go above where that vertex is, or is it going to fall below where that vertex is? And so in this case, we find y is either going to be less than or equal to k, or y is greater than or equal to k. And k is equal to the y value of the vertex. So it was y is less than or equal to k if the parabola faced down. So this was our point hk, recall. And it's going to be y is greater than or equal to k if our parabola faces up. All the y values are bigger than or equal to And that axis of symmetry, we denoted with a dotted line. It's really not on the graph, just so you can see that's where you would fold your paper, though. This was our x equals h value. Okay, so those are the things that you should be able to do with graphing and finding. So let's, again, let, let's go back to that example that we looked at before, but let's first look at it as y is equal to x squared, um, what was it, minus 8x plus 12. So what is the vertex? Okay, so there's multiple ways that we can do this. We can put it in vertex form where we would have to complete the square. If we put it in vertex form, this is y is equal to a all times the quantity x minus h quantity squared plus k. We actually technically don't have to, have to complete the square, or we can use the vertex formula. So we can find the vertex our h value of our vertex, we can find by looking at what is negative b all over 2a. And so that would tell me then if that was the case, if that's my x value of the vertex, then we can find the y value of the vertex by plugging that value in wherever we see it, um, an x in our function. So I'm gonna rewrite y as the same thing as saying f of x, just function notation. So our y value, our k value, this is equal to f of negative b over 2a. Okay, so if we want to go that route, we can see looking at our equation what our a value is, what our b value is, and what our c value is. So notice there's no number in front of our x squared. So a in our case is equal to one. And our b value 
And that one is equal to negative eight. Okay, so H is equal to negative B over 2A. So negative B, which is negative 8, all over 2 times A, which is 1. So this is 8 over 2, which is 4. Okay, so the vertex right now, you know, H is 4. So that's the x value of our point. And so now let's look at f of 4. So this is equal to 4 squared minus 8 all times 4 plus 12. So 4 squared, this gives us 16, minus 8 times 4. 8 times 4 is 32, plus 12. So 16 plus 12 is 28, minus 32. Well, 32 minus 28 is 4. Large one is negative, so negative 4. Okay, so we should be able to determine if this is a maximum or a minimum. So that again, we had to look at our A value, the number in front of our X squared. If A was positive, then it was a minimum because our parabola faced up. And if our coefficient in front of the x squared was negative, it was less than zero, then our parabola faced down. Well, in our case, our a value is equal to one. So our point four, negative four, our parabola faces up, so this is a min. So from there, we can see if it's even going to cross the x-axis or not um, by plotting this. So let's look at this. So we have a point at 4, negative 4. So go over to the right, 4, and go down 4. And our parabola faces upward, so we know that it's going to cross. Okay, so x and y intercepts. We actually did the work to find the x intercepts in that problem before. That was when we set the equation equal to zero, when y was equal to zero. So we're looking at when is x squared minus 8x plus 12 equal to zero. We already found that. We factored it. This was x minus six, x minus two equals zero. So x equals six and x equals two. Okay, so I'm crossing the x-axis here at two and at here at six. And then my y-intercept, well, that's when my x, um, x is 0. So plugging in 0 for x, well, f of 0 just gives me my constant, which is 12.
Okay, so this is where I wanted us to kind of look at what we had originally looked at with the inequality. We were looking originally at the inequality x squared minus 8x plus 12 is less than zero. So notice this, we said that it was in between two and six. Notice this is where our y values fall below the x-axis. These are the values of x which set this equal to, or I'm sorry, less than zero. Anything to the right of two, sorry, left of two is above the x-axis and the right of six is above the x-axis. Okay, so just kind of tying in some of the same, some of the concepts from the um, chapter. The other thing I wanted to, um, we, I asked you was, you should be able to tell the range and the domain. Oh, well, the domain is all real numbers. The range, well, notice that your graph, it's all your y values your graph is hitting. That's hitting negative four. And so you're hitting all the y values from negative four, and you're hitting all the y values to infinity. So your range, this starts, and it includes it, so we put the bracket if I'm gonna do interval notation. Interval notation a lot of times is used in mathematics instead of inequality notation. And so getting used to that is helpful. And then also the axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry, that's the vertical line. Vertical lines are always in the form of x equals. And this is x equals four. If they had asked us to put that equation into vertex form, let's say it said put f of x or y, which was our equation x squared minus 8x plus 12 in vertex form. So again, we did a lot of the work already. Um, vertex form, this is f of x or y is equal to a all times the quantity x minus h quantity squared plus k. So as long as we know what a is, as long as we know what h is, and as long as we know what k is, we can have that equation in vertex form. Well, just looking at the equation, you should be able to identify what a is right away. So a is equal to 1. h, we can use that vertex formula the negative b over 2a, well, we already did that, and we found that our h value was 4. And our k value was um, negative 4. And so now let's just plug in our values and we have our equation. 
And so we have f of x is equal to 1 all times trying to do color x minus h and h was 4 so x minus 4 quantity squared plus k and k was negative 4 so plus a negative 4 so I'm just going to change that to a minus 4 Okay, so we were able to put it in vertex form by knowing what the vertex was. So we didn't have to go through that process of completing the square to get it into that form. So that's pretty much, um, I'm thinking that's pretty much the, the stuff that you need to know from chapter 11. The only other thing, um, was the nonlinear inequalities. We didn't do a rational one. You should be able to do a rational nonlinear inequality. So I guess we could go through one of those. Yeah, if you guys want. Um, so for a rational, inequality, so that's nonlinear. So let's say you maybe had, and I'm just gonna kind of go easy. What if we had x minus three all over x plus five? This is greater than zero. Okay, so for nonlinear inequalities, if it's not already in that form, which ours is, you wanna get everything to one side of the inequality and you want to rewrite it as one fraction. So that's already written as one fraction. So you'd have to get a common denominator if that wasn't one fraction and then combine it. Once you've done that, that you're looking for your critical numbers. And so critical numbers were the ones that set the whole thing equal to zero. And it was the values which set our denominator equal to zero because that's where our function's undefined. So in um, later algebra courses, you'll see that that's where you have asymptotes. Your graph is never gonna cross that. Okay, so find critical numbers. So we're looking at when is x minus three equals zero? And that's when x equals three. And when is x plus five equal to zero? And that was when x is equal to negative five. So same sort of process. We took these critical numbers and we placed those on the number line. So we have negative three and we have five. And then we wanted to test to see if things were um, true or false on either side of a critical number or critical value sometimes they're called. So let's look at something to the left of negative three. So if I chose x equals negative four, technically on these, we don't really care what number we get back. We just care, is it positive or negative? Just so we could see if this is a true or false statement. And so if we plugged in negative four into the numerator, I notice that numerator is gonna be a negative number. So I'm just gonna put negative there. And if I plug in negative four into my denominator, negative four plus five, that's positive. So would a negative over a positive give me a positive number? And I know that that's false. And so now choose something between negative three and five. And so x equals zero works. And so if we chose x equals zero, put it below. I notice I get zero minus three, so negative on top, all over zero plus five, which is a positive on top. Is that greater than zero? And again, this is false. So on the other side, five to infinity. So let's choose something five to infinity. So let's say six. So if I plug six into my numerator, I get a positive number. And 
Sorry, I'm thinking something's wrong. Um, sorry, let me just go, go back to, <laughs> I'm sidetracking. Let's plug in um, six. So six is positive all over a positive. I know what I did wrong. Um, this should have been negative five right here. And this should have been six, not six, three. My critical numbers, I just um, swapped where my negative and positive were. I'll tell you why I knew that was wrong in a second. Okay, so anything bigger than six is true. Well, anything bigger than three is true. Okay, so why did I know that that there was an error here? I was getting caught up on plugging in numbers smaller than that negative three and not knowing that eventually I was going to get something that was positive because I have a negative over a negative number, which is positive. Um, and I was kind of looking back and seeing that. So I knew something that was off there. And so notice if now, notice negative four is not in that interval. Negative four actually falls between that negative five and three. So that's that's correct. If we chose something in between here, it should have given us a false number. Um, so let's choose something that actually is to the left of our smallest critical number. And so if we chose x equals negative 6, well, negative 6 minus 3 that's a negative number, all over negative six plus five, which also is a negative number. And it wants to know, is this greater than zero? Which it is true. Negative over negative is positive, and a positive is greater than zero. So anything smaller than negative five is part of our solution. And anything bigger than three is part of our solution. In this case, um, we would not include either of our um, bounds because of this greater than. Let's put the equal sign in there because that's a little more complicated case when that is a rational. So negative five, x really can't be negative five because it's undefined there. And so we have to make sure that this is a parentheses around the negative five. But three, if I plugged in three there, that sets this whole thing equal to zero and zero is greater than or equal to zero. And so we wanna include three. So we put a bracket there. Okay, so our solution. We're coming from negative infinity all the way to negative five parentheses union. Then we're taking all the numbers from three and including three to infinity. Okay, so chapter 12, we did, first we looked at operations of functions. So just the different notations, things that we had done before, just written differently. We also looked at compositions of functions and inverses of functions. And that brought us into logs. Let's first look kind of at the operations of functions. So let's say you had the following. So let's say 
f of x is equal to x squared minus x minus Let's say g of x is x minus 2. So let's say it asked you to find f minus g of x. Okay, so remember this notation is not telling us that we're distributing, even though when you write it out, it's saying f of x minus g of x. Basically, this is just saying, though, that you're taking your function of f of x and you're subtracting off your function of g of x. So looking at our function of f of x, this was the x squared minus x minus 42 minus, this is where you have to be careful. We need parentheses or brackets around this whole x minus two. Okay, so we need to distribute the negative. Let's bring down x squared minus x minus 42. Distributing the negative, we get negative x plus 2. So we have x squared. Negative x minus x is negative 2x. And negative 42 plus 2 is negative 40. If it said find f minus g of negative 3, that's not telling me to distribute negative 3 to that. That's telling me I'm looking at what is f of negative 3 minus g of negative 3. The thing is, I already did the function up here, so I could just go in and plug in negative 3 here. So we've already done a lot of the work. So if we did that, f minus g of negative 3, this is equal to negative 3 squared minus 2 times negative 3 minus 40. So this gives us negative 3 squared is positive 9, negative 2 times negative 3 is plus 6, minus 40. So 9 plus 6 is 15 minus 40, which is 20, negative 25. So what if it was f little circle g of x? Okay, we I mean, gotta figure out what f of x is and g of x is. Let me just go back up here and pull it if I can. Okay, so we want to plug in our equation g of x wherever we see an x and f of x. Okay, 
Oh, that's pretty cool. Let me get out of that though. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, f of g of x. So f of g of x, which is x minus 2. So this is equal to, so we're going to plug in, wherever we see an x, let's just put parentheses. So we have an x, so put parentheses squared, minus, you see an x, let's put parentheses, enough to put in x minus 2, and then you have a minus 42. So going back in and plugging in the x minus 2 wherever you see the x. For time's sake, um, if you foiled out x minus 2 times x minus 2, you would get x squared minus 4x plus 4. Distribute your negative. That gives me negative x plus 2 minus 42. So quickly, just combining like terms, there's only one term that has an x squared. So I bring it down, but we have a negative 4x minus a 1x. So that's a negative 5x. And we have a plus 4 plus 2, so that's plus 6. And 6 minus 42, so that would be what? negative 38. So f of g of x is equal to x squared minus 5x minus 38. So if it said find g inverse, of x. That one isn't bad at all, right? g of x is equal to x minus 2. This is where we swapped our x and y values. So this is y is equal to x minus 2. So x equals y minus 2. And then we solved for y, so add 2 to both sides, so y equals x plus 2. That's our inverse function of g. Oops. How about show that um, your answer in part D is correct. Okay, so there's, and I'm okay with you just showing one direction. We want to show that G of G inverse, the composition of the two, is equal to X. Or the other G inverse of G of X equals X. So remember, composition of functions are not normally commutative, meaning that we can't switch the order. They're not going to um, usually give us the right or same thing. This inverse functions, that does happen, though. We'll always get back x. And so this was our original, or that's our inverse function. This was our original. So if we look at g of g inverse, well, g inverse was our x plus 2. 
Oops, let me just write that. This is what I'm showing. So this would equal, so we're going to go back in and wherever we see an x, we're going to plug in this whole expression x plus 2. Okay, so I see an x here, so let's just put parentheses. And then we see a minus 2. So plugging it back in x plus 2, we get x plus 2 minus 2 just gives us x. Okay, so we showed one direction that taking the composition, we get x, and so we did it correctly. Okay, so you, you're not going to get one that's that easy of taking an inverse, but I don't think you're going to get one so hard that was a quadratic, and I didn't want to have to go through all that process. Um, let's actually take a break for a moment.